are the tapes of a sick old woman claiming to have helped a demon collect thousands of souls real? Were these her last words, a sort of confession? I'm Wally Fitch, and this is the Walk in Darkness Podcast. We're hunting for a book written by a demon, and you're coming with us. This is the Walk in Darkness podcast with Wally Fitch and Sutton Blackhill. Hey everyone, welcome to the show. What a week it has been. Um, so if you've missed the posts on Instagram, uh, Sutton is back to her usual self, and I'll get to why she's not here this week a little bit later, but... I have to say, this past week was some of the creepiest shit that I've ever gone through. Um, to, to give you a little recap on what's been going on over the last couple of days, uh, she was mostly catatonic the whole time. Um, but there were there were these weird times where she seemed lucid, but she just stared at me as if she was, uh, I don't know, trying to assess something about me. Uh, it's, it's kind of weird. It was, it was a bit of a blank stare, but at the same time aware, you know, kind of like dead, but alive. Um, kind of like a shark's eyes, lots of creepy moments. Um, like this one, um, one night I have no idea what time it was, but I woke up with Sutton kneeling at the side of the bed with her face inches from mine had that that creepy freaking stare just mumbling something that I couldn't quite make out needless to say I didn't get much sleep after that and was kind of creeped out to go to sleep at any point but um yeah it it was just it was an odd odd week Friday um if you saw the post on Instagram that's a day I will not soon forget the day started out with a blood red sky. And and, and I mean, blood red, everything was red. And and it wasn't really that muted red that kind of looks like you're on Mars. You know, some of the pictures we've seen from some of the fires around, it wasn't like that. It was this blood red, a deep red, an evil red. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of kicked off the day. It was sort of a, a quiet day until the afternoon. Sutton slept most of the day. Um, but yeah, like I said, everything was kind of quiet until about two o'clock. One of the most powerful storms that we've had here in, I don't, I can't even remember when we had a storm this powerful. Um, we, we had this big storm move through, uh, constant thunder, lightning, all kinds of crazy hail. I mean, th- this hail was nuts. Um, and you know, like I said, there's pictures in video, um, both of the blood red sky and a, of this hailstorm on uh, Instagram. Just go to at Walk in Darkness over there, and you can see those pictures. Um, so anyway, so it wasn't in too long after the storm hit that. Um, well, you know what? Hold on, I, I should kind of back up a minute. I brought in a few people that I know to help figure out what's going on with Sutton. Um, one was a former priest who is now a psychiatrist, uh, a nurse, and I even brought in a demonologist. So anyway, when the storm hit, we all went out to the porch to watch it, leaving Sutton in the guest room sleeping. Um, so we're out there, we're watching the storm. We're all big storm lovers. So we're kind of having a good time trying to forget about all the drama over the last few days. Um, and then once the storm passed, I don't know, it was about 30, 40 minutes. We went back into the house to find Sutton standing nude in the middle of the living room with her arms straight out like a cross. Her eyes had that creepy glazed over white look like a shark kind of thing. The first thing that came to mind was crucifixion. But the closer I looked, I noticed that her palms were facing up instead of out. And her head was tilted slightly 
up. Um, so she wasn't really mimicking the crucifixion. It was as if she was offering herself to something. We got her back into bed. A few minutes later, we heard the door creak open. Uh, Sutton appeared. She was dazed, but that creepy look in her eyes was gone. You know, since she hadn't eaten in about four days, we ordered some pizza. After that, uh, Father K, he's the psychiatrist. He sat down with her and asked her about what she experienced over the last few days. She said the only thing she remembers is an intense feeling of heat and being pulled either through something or towards something. Um, And we'll get into that a little more next week. But um, I want you to keep that in mind as I tell you about the next part and the reason why Sutton isn't here this week. So as it turns out, that big fire in Southern California in Orange County and Riverside County, well, that started in the town where Sutton grew up. Now, I, I know what you're thinking. Yeah, sure, okay, it's a coincidence. But first, I don't believe in coincidences. And second, there's this whole timing thing. See, her strange behavior started about the same time as the fire. The fire was was uh, reported about 1.17 p.m. And that's about the same time Sutton arrived at my house acting all weird with their glazed over eyes and all that stuff. So her family still lives in Holy Jim Canyon uh, where the fire started. And that's where she is right now. Mm-hmm. Luckily, the family didn't lose their house, but I guess it was touch and go there for a minute. It, it was close. So... Anyway, getting to why Sutton isn't here, we had this big, big fight before she left. I didn't think she should go. You know, I mean, after all that happened over the last few days, there's an obvious connection between her behavior and this fire, which is called the Holy Fire of all names. Holy Fire. Um, I, I just, I didn't think it was safe for her to go there. She disagreed. She basically told me to fuck off and that she had to be there for her family. So that's the update on Sutton. Um, You know, like much of this investigation, there is so much about the last few days that can't be explained. And uh, this is why I feel so strongly about continuing the investigation no matter what happens or how many people tell us we need to stop because we're bringing some sort of darkness. And with that, let's get into the last words of Agatha O'Toole. So what we're going to do here is uh, we're going to break this up into two parts. Tonight, we're going to talk about who Agatha is, who this demon might be, assuming he exists, of course, and the authenticity of these tapes. Next week, once Sutton gets back, we're going to go over the actual content of the tapes. We'll play the tapes for you and uh, what their effects have been so far on the people that have heard them. Now, as much as I wanted to listen to these tapes, a few things had to happen first. Okay. Um, I needed to understand who had contact with these tapes So before anybody else handled them or touched them, I wanted to get some fingerprints on them. So I was able to lift several fingerprints from each cassette, which I sent off to be identified. The prints came back, uh, three of the four identifiable prints came back to Sutton, Agatha, and Patricia. Patricia Donaldson, who you, we talked about last, uh, on the first episode, um, the fourth print, which really looked like a fingerprint to me, wasn't actually a fingerprint at all. Um, those are the people that handled it. Now, if there was anybody else that handled these tapes, they wore gloves just like I did. That's why my prints weren't on there. I always handled them with gloves. Now, the next step was to get the tapes over to Ann, who's my audio forensic specialist. 
And uh, after a couple of weeks of her doing her thing, she finally had the results. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read you the report that she sent me. The tapes arrived in poor condition. Both cases were dirty, but otherwise in excellent condition. Tape 1. The heads were dirty and slightly damaged. The tape itself had some wrinkles and folds and had a coating of dirt. The pressure pad was in good condition, but the tape reels were loose. Tape 2. The cassette was in better condition, but also had some damage to the heads and to the tape itself. The left side tape guide was broken, but the tape seemed to spin just fine. I cleaned and repaired the tapes as best I could before backing them to both MP3 and Wave digital formats. Per your request, I performed several tests to determine authenticity. I determined the tapes were manufactured in 1968 by TDK. Uh, other than the effects of being buried, the tapes did not appear to be tampered with. With one exception on the second tape, there is only one recording on the tape. In other words, there is no record overs. Uh, damage to the audio happened after the recording was made. Using standard voice authentication methods, I determined typical background noise, two human voices, one canine breathing, and something unidentifiable. The woman's voice was consistent throughout both tapes and appears to be authentic. I put her age around 69. Without having another sample of her voice, I'm unable to verify this with positive certainty. The second voice is of a boy around 10 years old, and the canine is likely his dog. The unidentifiable sound is very close to a jackal in its sound. However, the frequency is nothing I've encountered before. It is not earthly, but it's also not consistent with frequencies heard in space, so it's doubtful it's alien. As mentioned earlier, there is one anomaly on the second tape, side B. There's about 14 seconds where the frequency changes. It precedes the portion where the woman is having a conversation with this unidentifiable sound. This frequency change could be the result of dirt and damage to the magnetic portions of the tapes, or it could be something else. I would say with 97% certainty that these tapes are authentic, the dissenting 3% is due to the unexplained parts of the tape mentioned in this report. All right. So we know the woman on the tapes is Agatha O'Toole. That was confirmed by her daughter, Patricia, both in the letter that was enclosed with the tapes that Sutton found and in my conversation with her. So who is Agatha? Well, I tried calling her daughter Patricia back. As you remember from the first episode, we didn't end on good terms. And unfortunately, that still is going on because she refuses to talk to me. So we really only have the tapes, an obituary that I found, and the little bit I did get from Patricia when I did talk to her uh, to go on. So this is what we know. We know she was born in 1898, and according to to uh, her obituary, she died in December 24th, 1969, which puts her at age 70. She had two daughters and one grandson, who we believe to be the boy on the tape. Um, and taking what she actually said on the tapes aside, which we'll get to next week, she comes off very uh, angry. Uh, maybe not angry per se, but uh, disgruntled. You know, it, it kind of seems like she had a life of regret, you know, always searching for something, but never finding it. Um, and, and, and even though she had family around, you could hear a loneliness in her voice. Um, it seems her only friends growing up were this supposed demon and a raggedy old doll. Um, we know she was married, but her husband and marriage is never mentioned on the tapes. And you know what? Now that I think of it, except for the very beginning, her children aren't really talked about at all either. Hmm. Uh, Agatha also had a gift of sight. She could see an immediate future, which if you believe her story, she used to help 
this demon collect his souls. And speaking of this demon, who is this demon? Is he the unidentifiable part? Is this the demon Seraph? I think before we can answer that, we need to explore the existence of demons in the first place. Um, you know, it, it, it depends. Do they exist? Nobody knows for sure. Belief in demons depends on your religious and spiritual beliefs. As far as what a demon is, again, that's also open to interpretation. You know, they've been a part of religion and literature, mythology, folklore for centuries. Uh, I, I think we can all agree, though, that, you know, at least in concept, a demon is a malevolent force who brings evil to earth. If you go to the biblical side of things, uh, there are three hierarchies of demons. The first sphere or first hierarchy is the Beelzebub demon, which is a former seraphim angel closest to Lucifer and radiates pure darkness. They command the dark army and lead the forces against the archangels and help the balance of the universe. Serath is of this class. Uh, next, we have the Gressel demon, which regulates the duties of the other demons and makes sure Lucifer's wishes are carried out. The Astaroth demon, which is the gatekeeper of health and of hell, and is also known as the Duke of Hell. Under the second sphere, there is one demon, and that's the Ark demon, which is soldiers of the Dark Army, also known as the Revengers of Wickedness. And each one represents one of the seven deadly sins. In the third sphere, we have the incubi and succubi, and they bring Lucifer's message of darkness to earth, usually in the form of seduction. Then we have the cambions, which is the offspring of a demon and a human. Uh, now, before I go further with this, it's interesting to note that a lot of people don't believe these demons actually exist, that a demon and a human cannot have an offspring. That said, they are the closest to all humans and they play several roles. First, sort of a guardian angel. So when you hear the devil on your shoulder, it's one of these demons talking to you. They also bring the word of Lucifer to the priests and bishop, bishops of the darkness. And those are the ones that preach Satanism. And uh, there are more of these demons hanging around than you might think, according to my research and what I've been able to find out. Okay, so assuming Serath exists, and it is him that we hear on the tapes, who is this demon and where does he fit in the hierarchy? Well, as I mentioned, he is one of the top demons. Uh, demons he's in the first sphere he is the closest to lucifer and according to tom who studies demonology at the university of idaho and he's actually one of the people that helped me with something this week he told me that serath is a relatively young beelzebub demon and i'm sorry i can't pronounce that word that's hard for me to say um but he, he's a young demon who rose through the ranks and became lucifer's number two and he's arguably the most powerful demon ever to exist. And other than that, we don't really know much about him, or do we? What's on these tapes reveals how Serath might have gotten his power and his rank as number two to Lucifer. And that's what we're going to dive into next week when Sutton returns. Thanks for listening, and if you see anything I missed or have anything to say, please call my hotline. That number is 406-640-3368, 406-640-3368. And if you believe in what I'm doing, trying to help humanity by finding the truth, please, please contribute to the investigation. Go to awalkindarkness.com and click on Contribute. And with that, I thank you. Bid you a farewell. Wally Fitch out. The Walk in Darkness podcast is produced by Boozehound Entertainment and is written by Kate Boyer and Phil Boyer. Wally Fitch is played by Phil Boyer. Sutton Black Hill is played by Kate Boyer. Crossroads, our theme music was written and recorded by Grand Reserva. 
If you like this show, please visit awalkindarkness.com and contribute to the investigation and buy exclusive merch. Thanks for listening.